name is Sabina Simonson, Outreach Services and Volunteer Coordinator for the Talbot County Free Library, and you are watching the Talbot County Free Library presents Thinking About Your Stuff, Estate Planning for Genealogists. Our speaker is Mary Mannix, who is the Maryland Room Manager of the C. Burr Arts Public Library of the Frederick County Public Libraries, a position she has held since 1998. For 11 years, she was the library director of the Howard County Society. She also held positions at the Lillianfield Library of the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and the Maryland Historical <coughs> Society. She holds an MLS from the University of Maryland College Park and an, an MA in American History from the University of Delaware with a certificate in museum studies. Mary is very active in the Mid-Atlantic Regional Archives Conference and is her fourth term as Vice Chair Meetings Coordinator, but wait, there is more. <laughs> she was the 2011 winner of the American Libraries Association's Genealogical Publishing Company Award for service to her profession. Still more. In 2015, she was given the Martha Washington Medal from the Sergeant Lawrence Everhart Chapter of the Maryland Society of Sons of the American Revolution. And she has also taught genealogy librarianship at the University of Maryland and public history courses at Wood College. We are so lucky to have her here. Please welcome warmly the very accomplished Yay. Mary Manning. Thank you so much. It's been delighted to be invited over here to the Eastern Shore. Um, obviously, I have been here before, but as a Maryland librarian, I don't spend enough time on the Eastern Shore, largely because I will not drive the Bay Bridge, but I have a chauffeur who took me across this time. Um, and actually, I recently found those guys who will drive you across, and that's actually pretty cool. Uh, but as I get older, I get more and more bridge, bridge phobic. But that's neither here nor there. The reason we are here today is thinking about your stuff, a genealogist obligation. I'd like to admit, commit, not admit. What's the word? Confess. I'd like to confess. <laughs> not only is she a chauffeur, but she also feeds me lines. Um, I'd like to confess that this, there's a lot of do as I say, not as I do. Okay. Uh, what we have there are two of my personal family collections. The one in the basket are the is the is, is are the estate records from my father's estate. Artfully arranged, you can see I'm a good archivist. I spent a lot of time with records management. And then over here, we have a series of letters I found after my father died between my mother and the man that she seems to have been engaged with who was killed in World War II, who I, I knew nothing about. Um, so those are my own family records. So I know the other side. I understand where you're coming from. Hopefully none of you have collections that look quite like that. Um, but again, do as I say and not as I do. So. Well, you may be well. You may be wondering what this is all about. Okay, what kind of stuff? Why genealogists? This is something that I have been talking about really for about the last 18 years. And for those of you who picked up the handout, and who haven't, may I encourage you to get one later? I constantly get people coming into my Maryland room, as I'm sure you do here in your Maryland room here, looking for information about how to find family materials, or coming in and telling those horrible stories about what happened to Grandma's letters or what happened to a particular church's records. When I was in Howard County, um, a woman came in one time and talked about a church in western Howard County where in the mid 20th century, the minister as such, had a nervous breakdown, took all the records, put them out in the yard, and set them on fire. So you always hear these sorts of stories, at least I always hear these sorts of stories, or people going to estate auctions and finding <coughs> church records or governmental records, or again, as probably most of you are aware, part of the whole basic genealogy methodology you know, when you're making your way through the, the real basic beginner stuff, one of the things is to talk to your family members and then to find whatever family documents you may have in your own home or grandma's home. But you'll hear these stories again about all these things that were destroyed at various times, sometimes destroyed on purpose, sometimes destroyed in floods, sometimes just lost. And also, genealogists tend to have a lot of stuff. By the very nature of doing your research, you are compiling all sorts of material. If you think about the amount of money you spend on photocopies, I like to think that you actually have a certain obligation to take care of these things. I mean, you've invested money into this. And truthfully, if you've done it for so long, you probably care enough that you want to see what happens to these materials. Unless when you're done and what genealogist ever really finishes, you just toss it all away. I mean, that's not normally the genealogist who I interact with. You know, I will hear people also talk about, oh, well, you know, if grandma had only talked to me or only saved these materials, 
You know, while we all build on the research of other people, caring for our own documents, I think, is part of the genealogist's obligation, as I've said in my, in my other slide. You know, it's part of what you do, and also, besides taking care of your own materials so that other people don't have to start at the same place you start, we all know we have to do our own research, but it's certainly helpful if you can take a look at what someone else had done previously, even if what they did wasn't right, or you need to look at other documentation, but still going back to that. But also I found that genealogists are often the people who get the boxes dumped on them. So when grandma dies, or grandma gets moves into, you know, she downsizes, because you care about genealogists, you're the one who gets the box of the photographs, or you're the one who gets the old wedding dresses, or you're the one who gets the box of stuff you have no idea what it is. But you're the genealogist, you're the family historian, so you're the one who cares about these things. So I do think that it's a problem that many genealogists experience. It's a problem coming from my world when I hear people talk about items being destroyed, about you know unidentified photographs found in estate sales, found in auction houses. You know, if you think about my um, my coworker once mentioned how recently she was in a Cracker Barrel, which is really surprising because she's I love Cracker Barrel, but I have a trouble picturing her and eating in a Cracker Barrel. But she was in a Cracker Barrel and she turned to her husband and said, "You know, all those photographs are somebody's families. You know, it's those lost people. So the idea of making sure we don't lose these people as well, and also again making sure that you're able to care for these things because I do think it's important. And as someone who has cleaned out the, a house after someone died, and probably many of you have experienced that as well, all the stuff that you have to worry about. Not, and then to worry also about the genealogical stuff and the family history stuff. So I think it makes your genealogical world just better. It's part of your whole genealogy journey, shall we say, to figure out what's going to happen to your stuff at the end, and the fact that you often get stuff put upon you, and what will happen to that when you die. Um, again, if you've ever had to clean somebody out, if you only have two days to do it, it can be very difficult, and many times things get tossed that shouldn't be tossed, things get saved that you shouldn't save. I, I ended up keeping my mother's dining room table, which I hate for reasons that escape me, and I got rid of all of her um, paint by numbers, and I really wish, I, which was a hobby she had for most of her adult life, and I was like, why didn't I keep the ballet paint by numbers, and why did I keep that god-awful, ugly dining room set? So, you know, we have to plan for these sorts of things. Estate planning, I believe in our world, is an important part of what we do. Okay, so I'm going to start with some cautionary tales. This is supposed to be a cautionary, scary, like a scary slide. But again, I see a lot of, I see, I love my job. I see a lot of bad things coming from the mirror And I hear a lot of bad stories about ha what happened to different sorts of materials. And that's often how also I get collections. My Maryland, we collect both primary and secondary sources. So besides, you know, 20,000 odd books, we have about 120 manuscript and archival collections, and some of these have come to me, you know, on their way to the dump, actually. Okay, the first story I want to tell you is about Louise Wigley. This is Louise Wigley. Um, Louise Wigley was a spinster lady. As a spinster lady, I feel I can call her a spinster lady. Um, she never married, obviously, as a spinster. She was an upper-level math teacher at the major white high school in our county. She also was vice principal for a while. And during the weekends, not the weekends, but during the summertime, Miss Wigley would travel the world. She went all over the world and took an awful lot of slides. And I mean, probably everyone who knows what I mean by slides, you know, not, not PowerPoint slides, real slides, okay? So um, I know, about 10 years ago, I got a phone call from a woman whose mother had just died, and she was cleaning out her mother's house, and she took everything that she wanted, and they were going to have an estate, an estate auction, the auctioneer had come through, and she, her mother, had been Miss Wigley's best friend. And after Miss Wigley died, because Miss Wigley died after her two sisters, none of the ladies married, um, the slides went to her best friend, where they sat in the best friend's garage. And the estate guy wanted none of this. He wanted nothing to do with it. They didn't want it because it wasn't the family. So she wanted to know if I wanted them. And one of my favorite phrases is, um, you know, let me decide whether or not it gets thrown away. <laughs> so I went out to pick up these slides. I had no idea who Miss Wigley was. And you saw all those boxes of slides. And these slides are from all over the world. She has slides in Vietnam right before Americans were no longer allowed to go over. She has slides from Egypt when you could walk up to King Tut. She has slides of Africa. She has slides of the Soviet Union. She has slides of all over the world. She traveled all over. And not only did she travel all over, when she came back, and this was the part I didn't know until we started researching her, she was actually known in the community for her talks. She would talk to the Rotary, she would talk to the Grange, she gave talks all over the county regularly showing her slides of her world travels. 
So while this is the sort of thing I would collect in my Maryland room, because she was a Marylander, she was a Fredericktonian, she was a, an important part of the education community, even if she had just been, you know, a plain old mommy, we'd still want her slides. But more importantly, she was known as someone who traveled all around the country and the world and then gave these presentations regularly. And they're beautiful because they're slides, which are, I mean, if any of you ever use slides, um, you know, nothing makes a more beautiful image than a Kodachrome slide. You know, really, Paul Simon had it right. They are beautiful, beautiful things. You know, digital cannot compare by any stretch of the imagination. And while sometimes these slides don't live, necessarily live in what I would consider a wonderful archival environment, they tend to live in nice, dark environments. So like, the one time it got used over 15 years. So they're dead not to degrade. They are beautiful, beautiful things. And Miss Wiggly, I don't think just because she was a mathematician, all these slides are labeled and they're dated. It's like a thing of beauty. And these were going to go to the dump. And they're wonderful things. I have big plans to do um, like a series of exhibits, where in the world is Miss Wiggly? And just showing, like again, Vietnam in 1957. Just beautiful, beautiful things. And if they aren't labeled, she also has lists like that. <laughs> yes! So these are things that would have been tossed, that would have done, which would have made my life a whole lot less rich. And hopefully once I'm able to start um, you know, scanning them and printing them out, I made other people's life rich. And it certainly adds another element to her story because as genealogists, you all know, we all have a story to tell. And all of our families are an important part of kind of the puzzle that puts together that creates the world in which we live. Everyone is important in the world. Everyone's family is important. Miss Wiggly, although she left no children behind, she had no nieces or nephews, I'm assuming there are probably Wiggly somewhere in my community. It's not a big Frederick County name. It's not like Zimmerman or Brandenburg, which are version of Smith. But still, her role was important, and she played an important role not only in the, in the school structure, but also just what she did. So these would have been tossed because she made no arrangements. Her best friend made no arrangements, but thankfully someone called me. I'm sorry this slide is so fuzzy, but we also collect a lot of materials relating to the 4-H's and the Grange, and that's just the one collection that I got from the homemaker's office. Um, that's the kind of world I live in where people just bring me boxes of stuff, or I just go and get boxes of stuff. Um, this is David Lee Nutt, who is an individual that I research. I don't actually do my own genealogy, neither does my coworker. We often talk about, what well, Carolyn likes to say is the cobbler's children has no shoes. We don't actually do our own genealogy. We help other people do their genealogy. But this was an individual who I researched over the years. And even your own research notes. You know, as I said at the beginning, as a genealogist, I know it's hard to be organized, but you need to be organized to be a better, ge not just to be a better genealogist, but to be a different type of genealogist, but also to leave behind a paper trail that other people will concern themselves with. So as you think about you know, what are the items you have in your household, what are your collections that you may have, what are your own family documents that you may have, what's the fruits of your own genealogy you may have, those are the sorts of things that I want you to think about. What is going to happen to the stuff when I die? Okay? Now there is no right or wrong answer to this. You know, I kind of have a slight prejudice towards this because I would like everyone to leave their stuff to some sort of institution, but it's not what everyone wants to do and it's not always necessarily appropriate. But even if you think about who in your family is going to want these materials, is there really someone who does? You know, is there a third cousin? Is there a grandchild who would love to do genealogy one day? Or who may be doing genealogy and you don't even know it. But the idea, again, is just to think about this topic, to wonder about what's going to happen to your stuff. If nothing else, because as genealogists, you care about family just to make it easier for your family to, you know, administer everything when you die. Hopefully they'll all be so upset about your death anyway that they can't think clearly, but also then you want to make sure that they don't have to think that hard about what's going to happen to your materials. And also that you just leave a better paper trail for yourself. Um, a book that recently kind of changed my life in regards to this, I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, this book by, I never recon, I don't know how to pronounce her name, she's Japanese, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. It's been really popular recently. You know, organizing goes through these different sorts of um, themes. It's very interesting. It's definitely very Japanese. She's, she's, she works in Japan. She, she tells her story. She's been tidying up since she was like 12. You know, she would throw things away and upset her parents. It is, again, very Japanese, very nominal, but it's an interesting book, and I'm going to reference it as we go forward. She's also a little bit crazy from my worldview, but I'm more of a path map, shall we say, both professionally and, and personally. But it's a good book to take a look at in regards to this kind of thing. Okay, so what I want you to do, okay, the point here, I want you to start concerning yourself what is going to happen to the materials that you have when you die, okay? You've probably, hopefully, all of you already has a will. For those of you who do have a will, has anyone actually put in their will what's going to happen to their genealogical materials when they die? 
No. Usually I don't have anyone who does. <laughs> it's an oddity when I do, and usually it's a real show off genealogist. But you know, everyone hopefully already has a will, and it's good to have a will, but also do think about what's going to happen to your genealogical materials, okay? If nothing else, just to ease the burden of those people who need to come into your house, grief stricken already when they have to figure out what's going to happen to your materials. So first, what I want to do, I want you to channel your inner archivist, okay? So I want you to do a, what we call a record survey. You're going to figure out what the heck it is you have. What sort of materials do you have? So it doesn't necessarily have to be tonight, but it could be when you get home, you know, at midnight when you can't sleep because you're all concerned about what's going to happen to your stuff now when you die, or what happened to grandma's stuff when she died. And my God, she's right. What happened to the scrapbooks that I used to look at when I was seven in my Uncle Bob's house, and now I have no idea where they are, and they had all those World War I clippings in them. You know, start thinking about this. So look around your house, and what do you have? Okay, take a look at everything you have that's paper-based or three-dimensional based that's genealogical. Okay? So take a look at your own research notes. Okay? Take a look at if you were once the president of your local alumni association, do you still have some of those materials? Okay? Do you have great grandma's salt and pepper shaker collection? Okay? Do you have your own yearbooks from high school? Okay? Do you have a bunch of stuff that was in the attic in the house when you moved into it? which was put together by the people who built the house in 1935. It includes family photographs and pictures of the house. Take a look at what you have. Look at the format. So is it a book? Is it paper? Well, a book is paper. Is it book? Is it manuscripts? Is it three-dimensional? Is it someone's paint-by-number collection? Is it someone's really ugly dining room table that relates to the family? Okay. Also, think electronically. Think about your own file. So do, if you use Roots Magic or some other genealogical program, think about that. Do you have an ancestry account? Do you have a family search account? Do you even have a Facebook page? Those are all files and formats to think about. Take a look at the size. How many books do you have? I've got 55 genealogy books, and while you're doing it, I have 150 Nancy Drews. I have 15 high school yearbooks because I taught there and ran the journalism club for four years. Okay. Um, so the amount, the size, and also size. Are there oversized things? Okay. I've got the paint by number collection, and they're all eight by seven, except for that one huge one, which is three feet by five feet. I've never seen a three foot by five feet paint by number, but it could be out there. <laughs> and do you have any copy material? Okay, by copy material, I mean photocopies. And as genealogists, I'm sure you all have a heck of a lot of photocopies, okay? Again, all those things you spent various money on. But you particularly want to think about copy material, because if one day you do think about turning your material over to some sort of institution, not all institutions are going to take copy material. Okay? I'm a big fan of copy material, but if you were to turn your material over to, let's say, um, the Library of Congress, if anyone here is Library of Congress worthy, um, they probably won't keep your copy material. Okay? Maryland Historical may not keep your copy material. Generally, unless you're a smaller institution, you're not, they're not going to keep cop copies of things in other places. I'm not that picky. I don't. I'm more than happy to keep, you spent $300 photocopying an entire series of Maryland State Archives, I will keep it. I may not tell Mike McCormick down at the State Archives I've got it, but I will keep it. Um, we just don't tend to keep things that are in other places because archives, libraries, you know, we never have enough space, we never have enough staff. Um, that said, in the Twin Towers, there were, if you weren't aware, there were a number of libraries in the Twin Towers. One of them was, um, Maryland, New Jersey DOT, Music Department of Transportation Archives, which was gone. If you ever um, want to take a look, there's a really sad but very poignant um, film that the American Library Association did where they interviewed the librarians whose collection from the Twin Towers. But I don't know if this story is apocryphal or not, but there was a professor, either at Rutgers or Princeton, who had done a lot of research at the New Jersey, um, you know, the archives in the New Jersey DOT up in the Twin Towers. And everything there is gone now, except for the copy material that's in his collection at either Princeton or Rutgers. So while we generally don't collect copy material, other collections do go away at various times. So you never know. You never know. Okay, this is Our Lady from the Magic of Tidying Up. One of the things that she says in the book is to take a look at everything you have and lay it all out on the floor. <coughs> what she's doing is telling you to do a record survey. So again, if you're into or even if you're not into organizing, but if, I'm, I'm not really big into organizing, but I really love reading books about organizing. Just like, I don't really cook, but I love to read cookbooks, you know, that kind of thing. Um, this book is really worth reading. Um, and again, as I read it, I kept thinking, well, she's really talking archives. She just doesn't know it. But again, she's all about laying everything out. So she's essentially doing a record survey, you know, of all the jewelry. She's doing a record survey. So again, figure out what it is you have. Because you can't make any sort of decisions 
about what's going to happen to your stuff if you don't know what stuff you have. Even if that's a matter of finding out what you're going to destroy, even if it's a matter of, of buying nice boxes for it or figuring out how many paper clips you need. Well, not, I, mean, I don't want you to use paper clips anymore, but in regards to that sort of thing. Okay, where did it come from? The provenance, using an archival term. So when you take a look at everything you have, you know, make some sort of note for when you do your record survey form, which we'll get to, you know, keep track of where you've got it. Okay, I've got 15 high school yearbooks from a high school that I never went to. I have it because it was my grandmother's first husband's school where he was principal. Okay, where again did it come from? What was the background of it? The salt and pepper shaker, I have the salt and pepper shaker shake collection because great grandma loves salt and pepper shakers, but more importantly, she worked for McCormick for a number of years. I don't know if this is true or not. And every year they got special salt and pepper shakers at Christmas time, okay? Take a look at the provenance. Where did it come from? What is its background, okay? And then by do I really own it, I mean, and, and if anyone here has this sort of habit, it's fine, I won't tell anybody. Genealogists at times are known as dumpster divers, okay? Um, we've all, well, at least I frequently hear stories of things that are thrown out from courthouses, but that the local genealogical society saved it. Sometimes, legally, it was supposed to be destroyed. You know, and everything created by any government or any person, and I know that my director would not believe I believe this way, not everything is meant to be saved, not everything is meant to last, okay? Just like our tax forms. Our tax forms are not kept by the federal government for forever. And sometimes governments destroy things because they need to be destroyed. It's their retention schedule. Now, unfortunately, sometimes they destroy things that have really cool genealogical material. Um, about two years ago, I was trying to get a, figure out what time I was born. Okay, um, I was trying to figure, figure out, I was going to do my ast astrological chart, so I need to know what time I was born. Okay, um, My birth certificate does not say what time I was born. Okay? Both my parents are dead. My brother is 12 years older. We're not really in communication. I, wasn't, I didn't call him to find out what time I was born, nor do I necessarily think well, maybe he would have at 12, and his life was suddenly completely changed when I entered the picture. But um, I, I had no idea. So I called an archivist friend of mine who's the archivist at the hospital where I was born. Okay? I am so old that my birth records are no longer in existence at that hospital. They were not considered records of enduring value. Okay? The birth certificate is a record of enduring value. But at least at that time, New Jersey didn't put what time I was born on it. So I was at a loss. I could still do my chart, but it wouldn't have been quite as exciting. And then um, I had this like moment of excitement because again I am kind of a pack rat, and again as genealogists, you know, you know after you write down everything you think you know and talk to the relatives and write down everything they think you know, you look around for documents or three-dimensional items. I remember that in my jewelry box I had my baby bracelet, and on my baby bracelet was what time I was born. As far as I know, that is the only document on the planet that gives what time I was born. Okay. But not every good, so besides that cute little story, um, not everything is meant to last for forever. And sometimes people do get out of dumpsters, um, out of garbage cans, sometimes even buy on eBay things that legally you cannot own, okay? That, that governmental entities, when they go what we call archival astrays, you can't legally own them. So just think about that. I mean, not saying to come forward. Um, I know when I was at Harrod County, we had plenty of things there that the genealogical society had gotten out of the trash can and that we took good care of, but we never could legally own. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a couple, um, three really good books, um, which I wish I had written. And actually, I, I've been talking about this before. Any of these three books came out. This is my favorite, um, which talks about everything that I'm talking about, about how to be your own family archivist. And part of that, again, is how to do the record survey. This is, I think, the best of the three. Um, there's also this one. I have not looked to see if you have them in your library system. But I know they are available in Maryland Public Libraries generally, so I'm sure as genealogists you're all familiar with interlibrary <laughs> loans, so there's a way to get them in your hot little hands. And I know this is another one too. But again, they talk a lot about what I'm talking about. But more importantly, they've got forms in them, okay? So tonight at 2 a.m. when you can't sleep and you start going around the house trying to figure out what it is you have, you could set up a nice Excel spreadsheet if that's the sort of person you are, um, but also there are forms like this that talk about exactly what I'm talking about, which is identifying what you're doing. Okay, so, well, I want you to get started right away. It says with your genealogy, do it systematically. So it's more tonight, again at 2, at 1 at midnight, um, even if you don't set up an Excel spreadsheet, start writing this down. So don't wander through the house, just keep it in your head, you want to write it down. But these books have really, really great forms in them. And they're all three listed in the handout. When you're doing this, I want you to think about collections, which is how we archivists roll. We think about things in collections, and you're probably, 
if you've done research in any sort of archives, you have used collections, or actually even if you've gone into Ancestry or Family Search, you know when you're in Ancestry or Family Search, you know there's hundreds of databases. You know, each database is a particular type of collection. They kind of even call it that there. So you take a look. So collections would be all of your books related to genealogy, okay? Um, all your Nancy Drews, all those salt and pepper shapers, all the family documents, all those documents from your alumni association. Think of them as collections. And again, this is a term from the Society of American Archivists, some unifying characteristic, okay? So don't just come go through the survey and say, I have 500 books. Well, it's 500 books, but they may be divided into three different types of collections. So just kind of think that way in your head. And again, as a genealogist, you're already interacting with collections. Every census, think of like the 1820 census, think of that as one collection. So you already have that in your framework, just start labeling as such. <coughs> Other things to think about when you're doing your record survey, original order. What that means is that when you're going through your house, this is not the time to get organized. Okay? When you're going through and you get to your own genealogy files, this is not the time to think, oh, you know, I've been arranging it by surname for years, but now I'm going to arrange it by color of photocopy paper. This is not the time to do that. Okay? Original order is how it was arranged originally by the person who first created the collection. So you've got original order all over your house. How you keep your checkbook, how, I mean, not your checkbook, like how you write things in your checkbook, but how you keep your tax forms, okay, that's one way of original order. How you arrange your recipes, that's one way of original order. This is not the time to change that because the original order actually tells you something about the person who did it. So the fact that you arrange the salt and pepper shakers <coughs> by size is your original order for the salt and pepper shakers, okay? So think original order because that tells you something about the document type. So when you get all of grandma's photographs, okay, did grandma arrange them by family? Did she arrange them by date? Did she arrange them by size? All of that is telling you something. Okay, sometimes it's not anything really exciting, but it's always telling you something, so think about that. Collecting to kind, that is an archival principle, which means that if we have one set of records relating to a woman's garden, a garden club, we want lots of other garden club information too, because we want to pull together lots of information in order to create a research collection. So um, it would do us no good just to collect, I'm trying to think of a way to explain that. Um, in libraries and archives, we like to collect a lot of the same thing, okay? So in my Maryland room, I collect all sorts of things related to Maryland, okay? Because I collect some things relating to Maryland, I want other things created in Maryland. Um, because again, I'm creating a research collection, okay? Um, I also oversee the Thurmont Center for Agricultural History, which is at our Thurmont branch in Northern County. There we collect agricultural materials. So if I have one Grange collection, I want 800 other Grange collections because I'm creating a place to go to research Granges, okay? And uh, when you're going through materials, or when you're thinking about what's gonna happen to your materials, think long and hard about uh, breaking them up, okay? Think about them staying together, that collections, again, think of them as collections and you don't wanna break up a collection, okay? Um, and again, that's where provenance breaks in again, too. This is another um, worksheet from one of those books, which again goes on, the same sort of thing. You know, the things to think about when you're looking at a collection. This, these are really great books. Okay, and again, don't forget the impermanent stuff, which is the electronic stuff, okay? Your own files. I'm sure everybody in here regularly backs up their computer every Sunday anyhow, and I'm sure everyone makes another copy and gives it to somebody to stay in another house away from where you are. So I'm sure, again, you back up every, every Sunday, you're getting ready to watch Game of Thrones, you're backing up your computer. On Monday, you're giving it to your best friend so she can keep it in her house, so if your house burns down, all of your files are still safe. I know you all do that. Don't forget to track that material as well. Facebook is actually really good about this. When you go to Facebook, they have information about what to do with your stuff when you die. They make it very clear, you know, who can go in and oh, make the account a memorial or can also close the account down. So think about those sorts of things. Think about your ancestry file. Think about your family search file. Um, think about Facebook if you have it. Um, your Twitter account. Think about all those sorts of things. I'm sure probably many of you have been in ancestry and you, you know, found something on a tree and you emailed somebody so that you could get some information back and you never heard back from them. Okay? It could just be that they haven't been on, you know, you see at the top, have not been on Ancestry since 2011. Well, maybe they haven't been on Ancestry since 2011 because they're dead and no one thought about doing anything with their account. 
Okay, so it's important, I think, to track that kind of stuff. It's also just being, you know, not being, it's being polite. You know, it's not being rude in regards to the information highway. Clean up after ourselves as we go. You know, just like, you know, Girl Scouts, you go to a park, you leave it cleaner than when you found it. When we die, we want to leave the world more organized than we found it. We don't want to leave open Facebook accounts, open ancestry accounts. We want to make sure that those who clean up after us know to shut these accounts down or keep them up. Um, a few years back, a good friend of mine died, and we and another group of, of friends. We had there's this group of children's librarians I used to hang with a lot, and I'm not anywhere near like a children's librarian. Trust me on that. And every time we'd go to dinner, we'd have our photograph taken. Okay, and it was always difficult for the waiters because you know I'm still on the market, so I had to make sure that you know the photograph was really good because you never know who's going to saw it. You know, and so even after Barb died, we would still do that. And in the bottom, when we identified ourselves, we say you know I'm missing Barb running. Okay? And that, because her husband memorialized her Facebook page, every time that went through, it came up on her website, on her Facebook page. So it was actually, kind of, it was very nice for us. So again, think about that, you know, do you want it to be shut down when you die, do you want it to be a, a memorial in some ways? And again, it's great that Facebook, and actually I think there's a really horrible story behind why Facebook does this, but um, they are very careful about this. And I believe on Ancestry, I don't think so much in Family Search, there's also information about what to do, you know, when you die. Okay, here's a, here's a story, another story for you. Um, then I had a patron years ago called Alta Siegert, and Alta was a very, very good genealogist. By the time I ran into Alta, she had done doing her research. Um, she was originally from Baltimore. Her family was historically Frederick County. Her husband's family was also historically Frederick County. And after he died and Alta retired, I want to say from Social Security, um, she moved out to Frederick County and downsized and so on and so forth. So by the time I saw her, she was pretty much done with her genealogy. She would come in every now and again and just kind of look around. And one day, Alta called me and had me come out to her house. And at that point, she was she was on downward. You know, she was walking around with oxygen behind her. She'd been a lifelong smoker, so on and so forth. And she let me go through and pick out her books. And then she took me into her her you know guest bedroom, and there were all these notebooks, I mean, beautifully arranged. I mean, you can't really tell right there, but they were beautifully arranged, color coded. And she said, you know, this was her genealogy, and that she didn't know if the boys wanted it when they when she died. Um, but this was her genealogy. And as I said, well, if the boys don't want it, I'd be more than happy to give it a home. Okay? Then one day, we have a big obituary collection. Uh, my coworker printed, we realized Alta had died because we printed out her obituary, and there she was. And I thought, oh, I don't know what happened to this stuff. And then about a month later, I got a call from a man saying, you know, my mom recently died. I'm here from Pittsburgh cleaning out the house, and um, she has all these notebooks, and I don't want the genealogy. So I said, well, Bring it to the loading dock. Let me let me be the one to throw it away. Okay, so he met me at the loading dock, and he had all this all these notebooks. And then I said, Well, just who was your mom? Oh, my mom's name was Alta Seeger, and I was like, oh, She had promised me this anyhow. So the universe had brought me these things. That's how it often happens. And I don't know about you, but the universe brings me things when the time is right. And Alta was so organized, and not only that, going through this stuff. This woman knew what she was doing. You can see that just going through the notebook. She was such a good um, genealogist. All arranged, color-coded by her family versus her husband's family, the major surnames. She had some of them in nice sleeves. They weren't even necessarily archival sleeves. That's a printed out email, okay? Don't forget about your email accounts. And more importantly, in your email accounts, those things that really matter, electronic, is not permanent. If there's emails you really want, you better darn print them out because it will not last. You know, um, electronic. Let me say again, is not permanent. Even those people, my colleagues who work at places like National Archives, whose job is to worry about emails, like the president's emails. You know, they pretty much say to we have no idea how long this stuff is going to last. So if they don't know how long the president's emails will last. Our emails don't have a lot of hope for the future. They also need to be continuously migrated. And if people are just worrying about your salt and pepper shakers, imagine they're not going to continuously migrate um, your files and your emails. Okay. So if you really care, print it out. Alta had printed them out. She was she was superb. Everything was documented, and again, you could tell she really did a really good job. So you've done this record survey, okay? Again, you stayed up for 24 hours, gone through the house, you made a nice Excel spreadsheet because that's how you roll. Because you used to be an accountant or an executive secretary, and you really love Excel. Um, Now's the time to also think about preserving these materials as best you can, okay? What I like to say is archives are always a good time, but we are never a cheap date. Archival boxes, archival folders are not inexpensive things. 
There may be some things that are really, really important to your family. You may have some documents from 1810 that you might want to get folders and boxes for. You probably don't unless you're really, really rich. You know, and if you are, please give money to my marital room, her marital room. Give us, give us cold hard cash before you buy your own boxes. But there are other ways to take care of these things. There's real basic stuff. Archives, although um, it's a certain way of thinking, and I did have to go to graduate school, um, it's not nuclear science, okay? It's not like putting a man on the moon, okay? Basic archival procedures is keep stuff in a stable and temperature environment as you can, okay? Which means get that stuff out of the basement, get that stuff out of the attic, get it away from the hot water heater, stop storing your genealogy in the bathroom because you like to read it when you're in the bathtub, you know? <laughs> stop doing those sorts of things, you know? Um, stop <coughs> putting the only famed photograph you have of your Italian grandmother over the stove so every time you can make spaghetti, you can see her as the steam goes up and completely <coughs> destroys her, you know? There are ways to get around that. We can make copy images, you can photocopy materials, you know? Life is all about choices, and there are some things where you simply want to use the originals and you've made that choice. I'm gonna keep grandma up there. I realize in five months she'll be gone, but I wanna keep it up there. You know, you make those choices, but you also can make copy photographs, but be aware of what you're doing and what you're thinking, okay? So, stable temperature is possible. It doesn't mean you have to make sure your house is always at 68 degrees. Just get things out of the attic, out of the basement, away from water, and if possible, off anyone's floor, okay? Put it up a little bit, okay? Um, and do not ever, ever again use a metal paper clip. If, if nothing else, you come away with, don't use metal paper clips. Only use staples. If they're stainless steel, you can get stainless steel staples at, at places like Staples, of all places, for staples. Um, just don't use them anymore because they're bad. They're evil. When Satan fell, he brought with him staples. <laughs> And those little white things, I mean, probably no one ever uses those at all anymore, but don't, and nothing was adhesive. No more post-it notes. When you take post-it notes off, post-it gunk leaves behind. Do not use those anymore, okay? Unless it's something you really don't care about lasting. But certainly, okay, maybe on your research notes, but get them off of grandma and grandma's marriage license from Dublin, okay? No more post-it notes on original documents. No more of these things. This actually is from a Facebook page for a colleague of mine who's an archivist at the University of Maryland. And he was processing a collection. The paper just peed, excuse my language, just peed those things all over the place. <laughs> but, you know, we very seldom, I don't even know if they even sell these anymore. Um, but you remember, too, in the olden days, besides the ones that were self sticky, is fine, but the ones you have to lick, you know? <laughs> don't use them anymore. No rubber bands, ever, ever again. They rot, they rot quickly. Um, I hate to admit it, this is from my own collection. Um, when we moved into our new building a few years back, we also closed, we used to have an audiovisual branch that closed, and all the 80s stuff relating to Maryland came from the Maryland room, as it should. Um, and my archivist at the time, you know, this is, it's the catalog record, she printed it out and then wrapped them in rubber bands. This was in a climate controlled environment for like five years and they're rotten away, okay? Again, regular staples, little white gunky things, post-it notes, Paper clips, unless they're the really good ones that are coated, really, really good ones. Um, rubber bands, they are all the instrument of the devil. Do not use them anymore, ever again, okay? Um, and this is a really good book, which, again, I don't know if you have it in your collection because I was lazy, but it is in Maryland Public Libraries, written by two conservators from Montgomery County, and it's about saving stuff, okay? Uh, stuff is actually a technical archival term. It's a word we use all the time for, for things, stuff. Um, and it's really quick, like quick and dirty. If you want to find out how to take care of those Barbie dolls, they can help you with that. Also on the handout, there are a number of websites that I'm sending you to because again, you've done your survey, you have found all the stuff you have, you're now going to think about caring for some of that stuff, at least that stuff you really care about. And again, you're going to make choices, you know, as with all things in life, you're going to be a good consumer, make certain choices, maybe there's some stuff you don't care if it rots, you know. You've got Grandma saved every newspaper about Kennedy's assassination throughout the country. She, she traveled from state to state to state to get these newspapers, okay? They're just going to rot anyway. Maybe you don't care that they rot. You're just, you don't want to throw them away yet because you remember Grandma fondly, so you're going to keep them there until they rot. That's fine. You're not going to worry about photocopying them on acid free paper, so on and so forth. So you're making certain choices. But this is a good book in regards to figuring out how to care for certain things that you do have, things that are of value to you. Because if you're leaving them to somebody, you don't want to leave them something which is just like, oh, that was wonderful. She left me all those wonderful photographs of grandma and grandpa's 
anniversary tour through Alaska in 1885, or when, where they went back after Grandpa had spent five lovely months there doing the gold rush, and they're all stuck together. Okay, they're nice photographs, all nice, nice stuck together. So you want to take care of those things, which things that are of value to you because they relate to your family, your genealogist, and materials such as your own genealogy research that you have spent a lot of money and time on. Okay, this is from um, my, my Japanese lady again. Um, and I do not agree with this at all, but she talks about, you know, reasons to say things, okay? An attachment to the past or a fear to the future, okay? Personally, I think there's nothing wrong with an attachment to the past. Um, it's why I went to college. It's why I went to grad school. It's what genealogists do. Um, she's getting a little more or less negative about it. But her big thing is, does it bring you joy? Okay, so when she's there on the floor laying everything out, she's not saying get rid of everything you own. Just get rid of that stuff that does not bring you joy, that stuff that is weighing you down. I would say the same thing for, you know, grandma's salt and pepper shaker. If really it does nothing but make you worry about what will happen to the salt and pepper shakers in the next earthquake, or I have, you've got this great salt and pepper shaker at the same time you have a cat who you cannot keep off of the counter where the salt and pepper shakers live, you know, maybe it's something you do not want to keep, okay? But does it bring you joy? Is it important to you? But more importantly, does it give you information? Okay, will it give other family members information? When you pass and go to the big genealogy library in the sky, those people who have your materials in the end, will it give them information? Will the salt and pepper shakers give them information about grandma's years in the Cormac, where she was the number one secretary, which is why she, every year she got the special salt and pepper shakers? Because this morning, and this coming morning at 3 a.m. when you're going through the house, you write out that story, you write out the provenance, okay? Um, will it give you information? Does it give other people information? So does it give you joy? Life is too short for us, any of us, to have things that don't give us joy. But more importantly, from a genealogical perspective, does it give you information? Okay, um, for those of you who are regular QVC watchers, um, this is the box that Susie Orman, the financial lady, totes around a lot. Though actually she's gone over the Home Shopping Network. I didn't know that. I was going through channels once. Now she's selling on Home Shopping Network. Um, her mother lives outside of Florida not outside, she lives in Florida. And so, you know, they have bad things often happen in Florida, you know, regards to the weather, nothing else but regards <coughs> to the weather. Um, and this is something where she, again, is selling in order to take care of your own financial documents. And in the commercials, you used to see, you know, Susie be there, and she'd throw it into the ocean and it would come back and she'd open, there's all the birth certificates and everything, and all, and all of the other financial material, very nice and well cared for. Think about disasters, okay? Again, that's another reason I say don't keep things on the floor. And um, I'm sorry this is fuzzy, but there's a wonderful display out there right about disasters. It was like you all were planning for me. And there is a very nice publication right out there about natural disasters. And on page three, do you have a record of your personal property? Okay. Are you worried about your stuff? Do you know what sort of stuff you have? So if nothing else, besides the fact, even if you don't care what happens to your genealogical materials when you die, right now think about what your insurance company is going to pay for you when your house burns down, or you flood, or something along those lines. And disasters happen all the time. Um, we know that right now we go to Puerto Rico. Um, Katrina in New Orleans a few years back, I went to a wonderful, though sad, program. There's nothing an archivist likes better than a program about disasters. We're very excited about disasters. <laughs> well, I went to this wonderful program in, right after Katrina. The American Library Association was the first big conference to go to Katrina, after, go to New Orleans after Katrina. Um, and they were wonderful to us. A lot of really angry people, but rightfully so, but they were really, really, really great to us. But I went to a session all about um, people who had, librarians and archivists who had materials who thankfully were not destroyed in, in, the, in Katrina, but they didn't know that, you know. Um, and actually a number of priests were killed during that too because um, priests, and I, I'm assuming probably ministers too, but particularly priests, you know, when they, um, when they have to leave a church, during a disaster, they're supposed to take the sacramental records with them. And priests have died trying to get their sacramental records out, you know, it's part of what they do. Um, actually, after Katrina, some FEMA laws have changed because there were librarians and archivists there saying, you know, after the beginning of the cleanup, it was like, you know, I gotta go find out what happened to my materials. You know, and I had archivists up there crying at these sessions going, I had no idea what happened to my collection. And um, those sorts of so people like us are now actually considered to be like the next wave after first responders. If it's safe to go into the building, we are allowed to now go into the building. Um, but we weren't there. But anyway, so disasters happen. We need to prepare for them. Think, so back up your files. Back up your files. And actually, if you have some really, really, really wonderful documents, you know, so you've got um, 
the before mentioned grandpa who went to Alaska during the gold rush and you have his diary that he wrote on seal skin or something, you know, you may not want to keep it in the house or you want to make sure that you keep it in a safe deposit box or, you know, those things that are really, really important to you that are incredibly rare and unique, the sorts of things that, you know, everything is archival quality, at least in my world, but those things that are really, really special, you may not want to keep them in the house or you want to make copies of them. Make copies for your own use and then put them in a safe deposit box somewhere or in your best friend's attic, not the attic, of course, in your best friend's house with the other things. Okay, um, so now you're trying to figure out, you know what you have, you are taking care of it as best as you can based on your own budget and what you feel is important. Think about what's gonna happen to this stuff when you die. Okay, are you going to leave it to a relative? Do you have relatives who really want it? Do not assume that a relative wants it. Do not assume that a certain relative doesn't want it. Talk to these people, okay? You may not talk to them at all. Talk to them now, okay? You've been researching them for years, now the time is to sit down. Send a nice email. You don't even have to talk to these people anymore. You can just send them emails, you know. When I die, do you want my genealogical materials? Okay, will you care for them and will you make sure they stay together? Okay? And again, you may find you may be surprised who wants them and who doesn't want them. You know, genealogy is always full of surprises, but it may really come back when you find out who does and does not want them. And then you think, okay, do you want to give them to an institution? Okay? In an institution, the family doesn't need to fight over it because everyone can come see it. But not everyone wants to give it an institution, and not every collection is appropriate for every type of institution, okay? But think that through. And when you think about institutions, you know, I like to say that, you know, all libraries are, are, are not the same, but we're all equal, you know? As genealogists, you've probably been to little teeny weeny libraries that are open every two months when the moon is full, that you found wonderful, wonderful material, and you spent an entire day at National Archives and came away with nothing except a really good book from the bookstore. So you never know where you're going to find stuff. So not all of our collections are Library of Congress worthy. Only because, not that Library of Congress is all that darn special, it's just that they collect certain sorts of things. I collect certain sorts of things. We collect certain sorts of things here. Maryland Historical collects certain sorts of things. Not every place collects the same type of thing. So think about where your material will be best suited. Where will people go to find them? The salt and pepper shakers, maybe there's a salt and pepper shaker museum. Or maybe, in the community in which you live, a lot of people used to always work at McCormick's. And that is a place where people go to research McCormick's. Okay? Um, so just take a look at that. And again, you may, there may be libraries that you're very close to. You may volunteer somewhere. Okay? You may have places where you're particularly good with librarians. Okay? But if you go to the website for the Society of American Archivists, um, there's a nice little brochure on Deeds of Gift, which is the uh, instrument we use to legally transfer things from your own to the, ins to the institution. And a nice thing about donating your family papers and donating your organizational records. Okay, we've got to go through right here. Um, real fast, Allen County Public Library, you're probably familiar with them. It's the largest genealogy collection in a public library in the country. Okay. Kurt there will take anything. He will take anything. Okay. And again, it's Allen County. You know, it's in the middle of the Midwest and they collect nationally. Okay. So there may be places, even if you like, you know, I hate I cannot imagine, but I don't like my local public library, I don't like the historical society, or you live somewhere where there really isn't a historical society. Or there are places, unlike Maryland, who don't have our strong public library systems. You may be surprised, but we are incredibly fortunate here in Maryland, besides, you know, to employ us, but also that we have such a strong public library system, but there's places who don't, okay? So you may want to go up to a national level. Okay, at the same time, Midwest Genealogy Center, which is the largest collection in its own building outside of Kansas City, they're much pickier about what they will take. Okay, so what I want you to do is look deep into your heart, look deep into your heart, and think about where you want your stuff to go. So first, look deep into your heart, understand that you have an obligation to your family, to yourself, to your community, to all those librarians and archivists you have never ever dealt with, and to the people who are gonna come through and clean up after you, again, go on to the big genealogy place in the sky. You also have a responsibility to yourself and to the material you have, okay? To those things that you have collected over time and put time and money to. So look deep into your heart, find out what you have, try to take care of it as best you can at this point in time, and think about what's going to happen to those materials when you die. You know, Will it go to a family member? If so, make those arrangements ahead of time. Will it go to an institution? Again, make those arrangements ahead of time. There was a genealogist in Frederick County, Margaret Myers, who years ago got really angry at the local historical site. So she was gonna give everything to Hood College, who, believe me, did not want to see thousands of genealogists come. I mean, they were very open to the public, but they didn't want genealogists to come through. Finally, before Margaret died, she changed her law and went to the Historical <laughs> Society, 
Um, but she didn't tell Hood, I'm going to leave you all my stuff. And as soon as Margaret died, there were people looking for her materials because Margaret, a wonderful woman, wasn't necessarily overly forthcoming with how she made certain decisions on things. So, you know, she would say, you know, no, this person was your great grandfather. How? I'm not telling you. Um, and sometimes people's research conflicted with hers. So um, that is that in brief. There's actually a couple of really cool stories I didn't tell you. Um, but that's it in brief. Um, please get the handout in the back where I go into much more beefier information. Um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, no, no, no questions. <laughs> we'll do questions in a moment. Thank you very much. You are a fountain of information. Oh, thank you, and thank you so much for having me here. I saw a lot of people take notes, actually. So there is handouts and there is notes. Um, what's one of the things I took away from is that you indeed can lose your birth certificate, and I am 29. <laughs> we also have a fabulous Maryland room if you want to do your own genealogy or you want some questions answered with fabulous staff and volunteers. So come and see us at the Twelve of Epileptics.